Would you like to know the way to get a beautiful finish on your pieces of furniture, especially the tops, anywhere from a satin right up to a mirror sheen? Well, stick around. I got a method for you. I want to show you the method for achieving a beautiful finish on the top of a piece of furniture. And this is a uh, just a sample piece that I'm going to use, just one of these little round sunburst tops that we made some time ago. And we actually had a Shop Night Live episode where I took this crotch birch pattern material that was in the firewood pile, and I, I salvaged it and made a nice little compass rose out of it. And this, the rest of this is Cuban mahogany ribbon figure radiating outward. Well, I've got a several coats of varnish on this, and the last coat I put on some time ago, I brushed it on kind of heavy. I wasn't really happy with it, and I left some brush marks. That will actually help to demonstrate this process. Um, normally, I like I would I would add a like a little more thinner to this to let it flow out, or that brush I used may have been a little too stiff bristled, and I wasn't really getting a feathery finish on it. So I'm actually going to put one more coat on this. So it would be great for exploring uh, this method. Now I've already done some work on this side. This part here is untouched. So I'm just going to go through the process with this section and then we'll start using the other section because the first step takes the longest. Okay, and I've already achieved that on this side. All right, so here we are. You know, when we start out finishing, a lot of times you think the finish should look beautiful right off of the brush. How many people thought that when they started out? Like, what's wrong with me? Why is my finish all gritty and have brush marks in it? Those finishes I see in the stores or in the museums are just pristine and perfectly flat. Like the dining tables, how do they achieve that? Or pianos, how does that get so smooth? Well keep you the secret because they don't ever stop for a really fine finish, uh, a varnish type finish or a lacquer type finish. They don't stop right after the last coat goes on. There's a further process. After that last coat cures, there's a phase you've got to go into called finishing the finish. Okay, Think of it this way. We use sandpaper all the time. We start out with like a hundred grit or whatever. We're trying to smooth a piece of wood. Then, then I go to, I'm, I'm, I'm typically starting with 150 because I'm coming right off of the hand plane or the card scraper. So I'm 150 to 220. And a lot of times I'll stop there, but sometimes I'm in the mood for 320. And you know that feeling. When you get to 320, it's so silky and clear and smooth, and you've moved up through the grits of paper. Well, it's just like that with finish. It's hard to believe because we're used to this kind of coarse sanding. You've never seen this before, but you go through a progression of essentially sanding the surface of the finish and bringing it up to a finer and finer, greater clarity and stopping wherever you want. So we're going to finish the finish. I put several coats of water locks on here. Um, I started off with a wax-free shellac, uh, and I actually padded it on with pumice. I was, I was using a, like a French polish method because I was filling the grain. Sometimes when you veneer like this, especially when you inlay an element like this, you'll have little gaps around the wood uh, as much as you try. They're not perfect. And so you can try filling it with just layer after layer of finish. It will go in there, but it takes a long time. So you're better off if you can do some type of pre-fill. You won't have to worry so much if you've got the grain around the edge filled. So. I just took some pumice, sprinkled it on here, and using a pad with some wax-free shellac, I basically um, 
started the French polish procedure, and the pumice, which is white, takes on the color of the shellac and the wood dust or whatever, and it packs into the pores, and I ended up with a beautiful level surface here, so I have no gaps around that. Then I went through the process of putting on, I think I've got two or three coats of water locks on here, and the last one didn't, not great, but it's good to show you what happens. So you want, you could be spraying lacquer, usually that's what it used to be, a lot of lacquer, or varnishes. Now one key little distinction between those two, lacquer is more forgiving with this process because each successive coat actually melts into the previous. So if you've sprayed, if you sprayed five, seven coats of lacquer, each coat is melting into the previous, so in the end, it's indistinguishable where the layers break. If you were able to cut those from the side and see all those layers, you couldn't tell because they just melted in to the previous one. However, when you use a uh, curative type finish like varnish, each coat has to cure, then a, another coat is put on top and then that cures, they do not intermingle like the lacquer. So that is important to know because with varnishes, they're unforgiving in the sense that when you do this first stage where you have to sand the, saw, the top, you may sand through that topmost layer. And that's a real, that's the biggest bummer of this process. So you want your final layer of varnish to be smooth and full. You know, not, not crazy, but I like using more close to full strength of whatever varnish I'm using and make sure it flows out nicely. Then it's gonna cure. You're gonna end up with little specks on there or whatever, no worries. Don't resist the urge to go in and, and fix little specks because those are gonna get cleaned up in this first step. All right, if, if you do, uh, we'll talk more about the sanding through process um, and why it's more difficult with varnish, but tunnel varnish, water locks, that's what I tend to use on a lot of these small projects if I just want a beautiful look like that. You could spritz on a thin coat of shellac or you can go right for it. It really, it doesn't matter because the uh, shellac is actually holding it kind of in suspension and you're applying your first coat. It just happens to be that the pumice is there and while you're, it's so fine, it's actually abrading the surface like a sandpaper and it's packing in around. So it really doesn't matter. You'll just see it like you're, you're laying on a finish and you're also filling the pores as you go along. I'm gonna sit down because I have a better angle at this. So we're first going to do what's called level the finish. So all those imperfections, brush marks, little pick like bumps, whatever, no worries, we're gonna level them right now. And that's, this is the critical phase because we want to create this nice even matte sheen with no high spots and no low spots. So when you're sanding this, you're going to be looking to create that matte. I have it on this side already. I'm gonna show you how I got there. Now, the early days, I started with a, a paper, I think I was starting with 400 grit. That's way, way, way too aggressive. And then, then I would say like 800 to 1,000 or to 1,200 and then started using the polish. The problem with going up through the grits like that is that unlike woodworking, it's not as forgiving because once I got to the higher polishing phase, I could always still see some of the first paper scratch marks, like telegraphing through the finish. You could just see like the, the 800 scratches were noticeable. So um, what I do now, and I've read this, this has been confirmed by another guy, uh, Frank Pilaro, who has an article in one of these finishing books. What I do now is just start 
and finish this leveling process with 1,200 grit, okay? Wet, dry paper. That's what you want, 1,200, okay? You start and finish with that. It takes a little longer, like, to get the even mat, but when you consider you're not having to change paper and it's safer, you're less likely to go through the, the uh, layers, and when you're finished, you know the most coarse scratch pattern you have is 1,200 grit, and that doesn't show after the polishing. It's really nice, great way to go. So I highly recommend just try this with 1,200 if you're going to go with it. Uh, if 1,000 is the only thing available, you can try it, but it's going to be a little more. I know 1,200 is a magic number. Um, 15 will work, but the finer it is, the more it's going to clog and the longer it's going to take to level. Okay, so what are you going to use for a lubricant? Well, you can use water. And you're not going to hurt the finish. You can also use mineral spirits. And so I have used that as well. One caution, if you're using water and your substrate is MDF, make sure you have no little pinholes in your finish. Because that water will actually go through that pinhole into the MDF and swell the MDF a touch. And so you're going to be sanding. What happens is that you get a bubble from the swelling. And then after it all dries, after the finish is done, you're going to have a little bit of a depression there. And then you're going to have a depression when you're supposed to deliver this to a client and you notice that that happened. How do I know that? <laughs> I don't need to talk about it. Oh, my gosh. So we're going to sand this area. I'm going to spritz. A little water on there, okay? Nothing touched here. And I've got a felt block, which is just a firm felt block. I wrapped it in plastic so it doesn't get saturated during this process. And I mean, you can do it without that, but I just don't like the felt block getting all soaked. These are just work really well for on the surface. If you use a hard material like wood, it's going to be too harsh on the edges. You need something that has a little give to it because it, it moves in with the slight contours with the finish. A cork finish on a block will work as also. So you can use the cork, but I think the, the best option is having a felt block for this process. I only use it for finish, rubbing out finishes. All right, so I'm gonna start on here and where you end up not hitting it is usually the edges. But listen, it's sanding the finish. So it takes a little getting used to the fact that you're doing this the first time you do it because it's, it's almost counterintuitive. You're like, oh, no, I don't want to hurt the finish, but actually you're improving it. So we're just going to sand it with some water like this. And then you go around a little bit. Pay attention to the edges because those tend to not get leveled as fast, but you got to finesse them too, okay? Now, you can just wipe this off with a paper towel, or if you have a little like squeegee thing, this is a little rubber squeegee, also used for sanding. But what, look at what happens when I bring all this in. I've got a paste, actually. This is just made up of water and the varnish, that's the tongue oil powder mixed in with the water. So You didn't seem to be necessarily going with the grain. Is that not an issue? No, it's not an issue with this because you're, you're, um, you're dealing with the finish. So it's not really an issue. I, you know, on Same with strokes and circles. It doesn't matter. Not really, no. I just go straight here, but... I mean, I have tried to stay with the grain like this, but you end up overdoing it in the middle, and it doesn't really matter that much. You could, you could finish the last time go, going just radiating out, just so you let your last, but you're going to polish this up in such a way that it removes those. If you're only going to like a satin sheen, like just to steel wool after this, I'll show you that, then yes, definitely finish with your last once over will be with the grain here. This is a hard one to go with the grain. 
because you've got a sunburst off and it's small. So it's hard to be exactly with it anyway, but it won't hurt to be against it here. Now, once, once you've got the water off, you're going to see it. It's going to dry and you're going to catch it in the light. And I can see the light mounting off and you're looking for shiny spots. Those are the low spots. You want an even dull mat across the whole thing. You want to know that it's level. So I can still see a few little shiny spots there, and especially right along the edge here. I don't know, can you see that even there? A hmm. little bit, Strike it's streaky. I think not because the uh, you don't have any backlight. Let me see, let me give you a little backlight, see if this helps. Is it streaky or is it spotty? I don't know if you're gonna see it. Can you see anything over on the edge? Yeah, I can here? see streaks. Like streaks a... and little dots here. Here. Let me see not if the I can... not the white lines we here. Might need you to turn the light off. Okay. It's just dry. You'll know it when you're doing it. Um, yeah, we can see it. Yeah, I just want you to know that's what I'm doing. So I do a little more. This time I'm gonna focus near the edge and don't. Just stay light. Once you get to it in a certain area, just be gentle. Don't overdo it. Because as I was saying earlier, the thing that can go wrong on this phase is you could sand through the topmost layer and break into the second layer. And because each layer cured by itself before the next layer was applied with this varnish, there's a distinct break line, like a halo will show up right where you went through and it won't go away even after you polish it and everything. So what you end up having to do if you go through is just clean the surface off and apply another coat. And that used to always really get me because ideally you do not want to go to the rubbing out phase until about a week after, at least a week, you'll get better results with varnish, okay? I know it's hard to wait sometimes, but uh, same thing with lacquer. You wanna wait about a week if you can, but you can go a little earlier with lacquer because you don't have the same concern about breaking through the layers. So this is just called leveling the surface, leveling the finish. Okay, in order to create a good base for the bringing up the polish and the sheen. Now, if you don't get it all level at this stage, those little places that aren't will actually be highlighted later on. So when you're bringing up the polish, you don't knock, those don't go away. They actually will revisit you and haunt you and you will wish you had spent more time in the leveling process. So just take your time and just finesse the little areas like I can see near the edges here. I've got a little, little more here. And anyway, I would just go over the whole thing like that. Now, sometimes on your paper while you're sanding, you're gonna get these little pearls of varnish. They glob up on your paper. They clog the paper pretty quickly really equivalent to sawdust on sandpaper. But these are annoying because they ruin the effectiveness of the paper as soon as those start hitting. I found that I keep a little scrub brush like this. I just cut one in half. I just scrub the paper with my scrub brush. And then look, all those little clogs are gone for the most part, right? So you get more life out of your, your paper when you're doing this process, if you keep a scrub brush nearby. Because uh, it can get expensive if you just go through this over and over. But once they really clog up, you're pretty much done, and it's time for a new piece of paper. Are you ever nervous that the finish is too thin after you've started? Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I am with, um, with varnishes. That's why you want to make sure you get that last one on. And if you wait a full week, you're less likely to go through. And with 1,200, you're less likely to go through. If you started with 800, like I used to, I mean, you could feel the, the abrasive cutting. You know, it would really 
cut faster. But um, I mean, I used to use that method and until I realized I kept seeing the scratch pattern and decided to go here. Now a lot less I have gone through with this. And I've used various catalyzed lacquers. Those are even more forgiving. The varnish is probably the hardest because the catalyzed lacquer, I just spray it on. I can go over two coats, one in each direction. I know that last coat is built up enough that I don't have to worry. It's these brush on coats uh, that, you know, you want to make sure that last coat is full bodied and uh, adequately applied. All right, let's just imagine right here, I've finished the whole leveling process. I've got a nice even mat, no little shiny spots, and I'm ready for the next phase. At some point, it'd be good if you could explain the difference from steel wool, steel, steel wool and 1200 sandpaper. A steel wool is when you're really <laughs> determined and you won't be denied. Yes, thank you. So that's a perfectly timed question because we've got it leveled. Now, let's say you didn't want to bring up a higher sheen. This would be the place where you would now shift the steel wool and it's going to be a four aught steel wool, the finest of the steel wool. So four zeros, four aught is the whole thing. And now you can buy expensive stuff called Liberon. Um, I know there's other types, really beautiful steel wool. It comes in rolls. It's like it's combed. It's really nice if you're going to be doing a lot of this. But um, I, I'm not doing as much of that. So I'm still, now I'm back to buying the bags. And I use uh, just the regular pads, but you can unroll the pad to give you a longer, smoother material. And then I'll take it and just wrap it inside my felt block. And now I have a beautifully smooth abrasive pad of my steel wool rather than just taking the clump. You know how that is? And you're like rubbing with a ball and it's hard to get an even pressure. Here you get a nicely distributed scratch pattern. So this is steel wool. This is 1200. So we're going to see a little difference here. Here at this point, I will use the steel wool in with the grain here. I'm going to create a scratch pattern. This will give you like a satiny sheen, okay? But it is created with a scratch pattern. So it, it works best if you wait the week. I'm telling you this. If you don't wait, it's not as um, agreeable. You know, the, the finish hasn't reached full properties and it's not as agreeable to this phase. Now, I don't know if you can see the difference there. Okay, so it's getting brighter and there's a nice soft glow on there. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times this is where I'll stop. I'll just put a polish on there if you want a more satiny sheen on a piece of furniture. So that's it. So the, the steel wool is a finer abrasive than the 1200. You can tell because it's bringing up a brighter sheen. And man, does it feel silky. Just feel that. <laughs> I know you can in your mind, right? Once you decide, all right, I want to go there or stop there, you could stop right at the steel wool and just use a polish. But I'm going to show you how you can bring it up to a higher, brighter, even mirror finish. And the method for that, old school method, would be to you start with the 2F pumice, okay? I'm gonna just do for the kicks. I haven't used this for a long time. Let's just go ahead and focus on this area. So this is the 2F pumice. If you feel it, you can feel like a grittiness, finer than like baking soda though, you know? You know how gritty like baking soda is? This is finer than that, but you can definitely feel a kind of abrasive. It's, it's not as soft as like baby powder, you know? It's a little more coarse than that. But you've got that in that, what I, what I ended up doing was I'd make these balls of like cheesecloth with an oil or you can use thinner. And yeah, this still has like a paint thinner in it. Can smell it. Or there are rubbing oils that you can buy as well. 
Um, you could even use like old English oil. I'm going to just put a little of this on here, something like this, or even mineral oil. But mineral oil is pretty heavy bodied. That would work as well. You need some type of like lubricant for this to scuff. Now, I subdivided my pumice into a little shaker like this, and so I can just spritz a little on. You can put it on your rag too, but let's just do this. You hear that? Listen to this. I'm not going to care about grain direction right now. I just want to show you what happens. Man, it's been a while since I've used this stuff. Yeah, there's other types of varnishes that work well, like an alkyd varnish. A polyurethane will not work well. It's just too hard of a resin. It doesn't accept the rubbing out process very well. It shows more scratchiness. So that's why tongue oil or tongue oil blends, they usually are mixed with an alkyd type varnish, which is softer resin than the polyurethane. Those are the kind of resins you want to rub out like this. So you got to stick kind of in that range, and they're more acceptable to this. You know, there's some give and take with finishes. Like the harder the finish, like a polyurethane, the more durable and protective it is. But the less appealing it is, it doesn't look great. It won't take a really fine rubbed finish like this. It's just too hard. If you ever you can try it. You'll you'll notice it immediately because you'll just say, wow, this feels almost like glass compared to this other one is softer, but it's still, you know, the water locks like this. Yeah, it's a little softer, but it's it's definitely uh taking to the sheen. So I don't know, can you see that? Mm -hmm. All right, so now it's shinier here right from the 1200 grit. So you could use that alone and go over this whole thing. This is still the steel wool. I'm going to end up going over that in a minute. But uh, So that's the 2F. Let's, for the heck of it, let's go to the 4F. Same deal, little shaker. You got to make sure you clean off all the 2F first or you'll just be pushing that in. You don't want to be contaminated with the more coarse grit. But again, you're going to look over the whole thing and make sure you've got even mat from the 2F. If you don't, you still have some 1200 grit abrasiveness and it's going to look cloudier there. I can see a little bit here, but I'm not going to worry about it right now. You'll also notice if you sand it through at this phase at any location, it's kind of a bummer. All right, so we're going to go to the 4F. We'll just sprinkle a little on there. And I'll put get my 4F pad, put a little more oil on there, and let's see if this comes up to sheen. Okay, there we go. Let's rub that off. See it getting shinier? Okay, so now we're at 4F right across here. And this is a beautiful way to do finishing, but it's only as good as your leveling stage. So you've got to put the time in at the 1200 and get it to a good stage. Then you put throw a polish on here. Now I would spend more time making sure I'm a little cloudy on the edges. I didn't really pay attention there, but it's really good in some of these areas here. Now, I could go all the way to rotten stone. This is super fine powder. It can be used to polish uh, silver and whatever. You mix it with uh, mineral oil to make a little slurry. And uh, it's really crazy. It, but it has an abrasive, but it doesn't even feel like it does. It is literally soft, like cigar, or cigar ash, right? Let's just throw a little on there. One little thing I've mentioned a number of times before is that paper towels have an abrasive quality as well. And right from the steel wool, I'll often just wrap a paper towel around my felt block 
and burnish the steel wool uh, treatment, and it will brighten it a touch more before the um, final polish. All right, so I'm not even going to put oil on this. I'm just going to see if we can brighten it a touch. So this is like the very final kind of polishing stage to even things out, clean up any discrepancies, and it just makes a beautiful last stage. And then after this, I gotta clean that off. So I can see that. This is how you get that like mirror finish with old school method, okay? And then put like a polish on there. I'm not really taking it all the way, but look at that. Well, I just want you to see that's a nice bright finish. Now I'm gonna that's basically the approach, all right, is to take it up through grits after leveling and bring it to whatever sheen you want to stop at. Okay? Now, this half, I just want to show you the more modern method and why. I no longer use the pumice because it's it's it works, but you can see there's more ingredients. You got to mix it yourself. The beauty of the automotive polishes is that you get superior end results with it already pre-mixed. This is Meguiar's version. There's the number one cut. It's a medium cut. That's about equivalent to the 2F. Okay, it's it's very close. This is the number two. It's the fine cut. They call it a cleaner, but you'll just, they're just numbered. One, two, and then the last one, I don't know why they go to number nine. <laughs> nine <laughs> is the swirl mark remover. This is equivalent to the rotten stone. Okay, so this is, uh, this is your pumice. You're two, four, and, and rotten. And this method is the same you could use to buff out your car and make it like brand new. Because you have this deep, thick clear coat on most modern cars that you can start with a medium cut. And what I use on larger tables now is I'll use an automotive like polisher. This is my polisher for larger tables. And with in conjunction with these foam pads that you know I only use a certain this looks like it's the number one is little orange on there, but I would use this grit with this pad and then I have another pad that's only with the second one and then the swirl mark remover is only with like the black you know so this has the final swirl and you just switch them out and you put a little on and then you run this at like 1400 rpms and it does a beautiful job on a larger thing but I actually used it on my son's car when we did a little work on it. And I went through the same, I used the same polishes and it worked beautifully, you know. So anyway, I'm just going to go through this really quickly. Same process, it's just a more convenient material. You can use the power method or if you have a smaller project, you can use the hand method like this. So again, I'll just use my felt block. Let's get a little, get a few of these. I don't, I don't believe there is. I've used it, never had, never seen fisheye contamination, which the silicones will create. All right, so here's the medium, and I'll just do it again. I hear it? Sounds just like the 2F, doesn't it? And when you're polishing, it sort of dries, and, and you can tell when you're done that, that phase. But this is nice. You don't have to have the powder and all that. It's nice to have the pumice for filling grain if you're French polishing and that kind of thing. Here I've got a nice sheen. It seems it's not as bright as the 2F. So I'll go next. Like I would have done that really adequately. And I cleaned off all that grit. Then I'll go to the... There, oh, there go. we go. All right, so let's get a fresh paper towel. Now, a lot of finishes you might get will say they're satin, 
in that case, they have additives to the finish so that when they dry, they leave a satiny sheen. And what they do, they have additives like um, sterates that cause the, the wood to, the light to disperse and look more satin. It's also a little cloudier, but it greatly simplifies the process. If you want a satin finish, like I will use satin waterlocks a lot on pieces that I don't really want to rub out. So like a chest of drawers, I did this shaker chest of drawers and the last coat I wiped on was a satin waterlocks. And then after it cured, all I did, I took 2000 grit uh, sandpaper and just lightly hit it and knocked all the nubs off. It didn't change the sheen, didn't show, and then it, and it, but it softened the finish and I had a nice satin finish. I didn't have to go through all this work. So you don't necessarily, this, this is more an approach that you're using on a top of a table where you really want some refinement. So not so much the legs and the apron. You probably wouldn't go to that extent. No, you can, but it doesn't take as much work. So you can brighten that up with just using a rag and buffing it with the various compounds. You'll see it come up pretty fast. Um, for, for those, obviously, you're not leveling a rounded leg or whatever. Um, you could just lightly sand. If you had a flat apron, yes, you would do a little leveling, but it's, not, it's nowhere near as fussy because this is in the reflective light and you see everything going on. So now I've got this sheen and this is even a little brighter than my other one, but I haven't even hit it with the, the final swirl mark remover. So let's just do this and we'll wrap it up. So I just clean that last surface, hit a little swirl mark remover, whoops. <laughs> Let's soak in here a little. I have to switch towels here. But this stuff has, feels like it has a little waxiness to it. And boy, and when you have the surface leveled and you go fully through the various cuts, the polishes are equivalent to going through a sanding process. It's just a different abrasive in each one held in suspension you're getting that abrasive. You see that now? I mean, this now, look at this. It is like a shimmering jewel. I usually do still use, once I deliver the piece, I'll hit it again with just like a, a polish. So Guardsman makes a nice polish. Uh, or I like this um, Goddard's it's lemon oil and beeswax. Spritz that, it just brings up the full rich depth mirror-like look of that piece. I, I uh, think this can be give you terrific results and really wow your friends. Because that's all we're after. <laughs>